I didn't feel like I was myself, and I felt like that surely there needs to be another way. I would be dead without them. Psychedelic mushrooms are re-entering our consciousness as a way to treat depression, addiction, and other medical issues exacerbated by the stress of the last two years. People are desperate for more treatment options. Though recent studies seem promising, these drugs are still illegal in the U.S., and questions remain about psilocybin, the active ingredient in hallucinogenic mushrooms. Everybody's on a learning curve right now. Will Washington follow Oregon's lead and legalize psilocybin-assisted therapy this year? I feel like there's a lot of education that needs to go forth. Our panel of experts weighs in. We don't need more research to implement right to try. What they do with the pills and give to our veterans, it's just not working. It's a trip towards some answers on the next City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. A new movement to allow for the use of psychedelic mushrooms as a treatment for mental health problems is gathering momentum. Oregon voted in 2020 to legalize psilocybin, the active ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms in medical settings, and our state could see a similar measure on the ballot this fall. In Seattle, the city council recently decriminalized the use of psychedelics, and scientists at the UW are currently researching the effects of these drugs too. Locally and nationally, there's a growing demand for psilocybin as a response to a rising number of depression and anxiety cases. But there's also a growing voice of caution about a powerful psychoactive drug that's not completely understood. These are psilocybin mushrooms. Peggy Button is one of many sellers here at an underground market for federally banned psychedelic mushrooms at an undisclosed location in Western Washington. The market's organizers, who screen customers coming in, say they're helping people with mental health and chemical dependency issues. And Peggy says products containing psilocybin, the hallucinogenic chemical and so-called magic mushrooms, are part of a healthier, non-pharmaceutical answer. We're just learning. Everything is all, everybody's on a learning curve right now. What people are learning here from veterans who need help to deal with PTSD to others coping with daily mental stress like Duncan Rolfson, is that these mushrooms, long known for their psychedelic effects, can provide significant therapeutic benefits as well. The magic mushroom aspect of it is kind of fading away and, and we're moving slowly into the medicinal mushroom aspect of it and figuring it out at places like this market. Health officials have a lot to figure out right now with Johns Hopkins studies showing therapy using psilocybin was four times more effective than therapy with traditional antidepressants. Oregon lit a fire under this debate as the first state to vote to legalize therapeutic psilocybin in 2020. And some say sanctioning psychedelic mushrooms is long overdue. These helped me breathe back in 2014, and I would be dead without them. Darren McRae a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, has dealt with debilitating tremors his entire life and a worsening case of rheumatoid arthritis. He tried using marijuana when the painkillers he was prescribed didn't work, but it wasn't until he tried mushrooms, as seen in this video he sent the Seattle Channel, that he says his tremors came under better control. McCray is hoping Washington State can change its tune on the use of psychedelic drugs as it did with marijuana over the past two decades. We can't just do this medical. We need, to, uh, we need to do it recreational as well. Not so fast, says Dr. Nathan Sackett. As a psychiatrist, I have concerns. These are not benign substances. Sackett, an addiction psychiatrist at UW, testified on his own behalf this spring in favor of the failed Senate Bill 5660, which would have allowed adults over 21 to go to licensed facilities and use psychedelic drugs under supervision. I think that psilocybin is something that from a pharmacologic perspective is quite safe. Sackett says psilocybin in a clinical setting can provide what the FDA called a breakthrough therapy for severe depression in 2019. But he wants cautious study, not business or market pressures to lead the legalization effort. My hope as a physician and as a researcher is that we can do it in a way that's thoughtful 
and that's clear headed and that's not motivated by external factors like profit margin. But with depression and anxiety skyrocketing during the pandemic, the pressure for new, more effective answers is on. One of the high points of anxiety, pan panic attacks, depression was when I was in the middle of COVID having to run tilt restaurant. Maria Hines, a James Beard Award winning chef, had to shut down her beloved Tilth restaurant in Seattle during the pandemic, okay. while also dealing with a seasonal depression she's had for years. I didn't feel like I was myself, and I felt like that surely there needs to be another way. Traditional antidepressants weren't working. So after a Seattle City Council vote to decriminalize psychedelic drugs, Hines began microdosing taking small amounts of psilocybin that allowed her to live and work without side effects or concerns about addiction. It really was psilocybin that has helped me with my anxiety and depression. As she told state lawmakers, she's not the only one who could benefit. I support the legalization of psilocybin in a safe therapeutic setting because we really need it. Mental health issues keep climbing and climbing and whatever we can do to end the suffering would be my greatest wish. Are we putting the cart before the horse? Thus far, Olympia is not on board with legalizing psychedelic drugs. And a state initiative recently filed, similar to Oregon's, still needs signatures to make the ballot this fall. But as psilocybin advocates like Mike Rantel say, the need for new treatments for anxiety and depression might soon outweigh the concerns of the opposition. It's gonna be a long fight, but I think it needs to happen. And joining us to discuss this matter further, we have with us Patrick Seifert. He is working on the psilocybin legalization effort with ADAPT, which is a PAC supporting I-1886. He's also founder of an advocacy group called 22 Too Many. Patrick, good to have you here. We also have Leonora or Leo Russell. She's a family therapist, executive director of the Entheo Society of Washington, and a sponsor of I-1886 to legalize psilocybin in Washington state. And finally, Dr. Sunil Agarwal. He's a physician and co-founder of the Advanced Integrative Medical Science or Ames Institute in Seattle. Thanks everybody for being here. And Dr. Agarwal, I wanna start with you here. Tell us briefly about the Ames Institute and broadly, if you could, to set the stage here, why you think this discussion about legalizing psilocybin is important. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Brian. Um, so the Ames Institute is a cl uh, teaching clinic and research institute that was founded in 2018, about four years ago in Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm myself and Dr. Leanna Standish are that's co-founders uh, and we practice uh, integrative medicine there and we teach integrative medicine and we try to do research on what we're doing. And one of our areas of uh, real keen interest in that uh, is to treat patients with chronic and serious illness um, and, um, and, and include and mental health conditions as well. And we're very interested in the role that um, psychedelic entheogenic is another term uh, healing or medicine can be uh, utilized in helping alleviate the distress associated with life-threatening illness, serious illness, and mental health conditions. We've been able to use um, ketamine, but we know that there's a whole family of compounds that are out there um, historically, col uh, cross-culturally, um, um, and, and we, want, we, we, we know that the research is very strong. We want to contribute to that. We want to contribute to um, patient care, uh, especially for patients whose needs are are um, uh, more time sensitive. Our patients and many other patients in our community um, need, need help now. Uh, Leo, if you could, could you give us a quick description of your group, the Entheo Society of Washington, and give us the big picture of what you're trying to do with I-1886? I was working in mental health and chemical dependency um, for 20 years here in Seattle with the uh, mental health crisis that um, Sunil was just speaking of. Um, and I felt like I was kind of stuck in that system. And that's how I got into Decrim Nature Seattle and started um, leading that organization. And as we know, that led to eventually the um, decriminalization of entheogens in Seattle proper, but that doesn't really allow a lot of uh, protections. And so I began the 501c3 Entheo Society of Washington. I'm currently trying to get a space in downtown Seattle, but it's an organization that wants to do outreach and advocacy. So currently we do free workshops that um, just kind of shine a light on people already doing plant medicine in our communities. So 
um, featuring a lot of like native First Nation people that are currently util utilizing these plant medicines with their people. And um, similar to what Dr. Sunil mentioned, just uh, really outreach to um, educate the public on the meaningfulness of these plant medicines in terms of um, the mental health crisis that we see and the chemical uh, dependency crisis that we kind of see afoot in our communities. Um, and so that's what Entheo Society does. Um, and you can check it out at entheosocietywa.org. But the ADAPT initiative um, is very similar to 109 in Oregon as a legal framework for um, legalizing psilocybin for uh, mental health treatment, but also, okay. yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I know we're going to talk a lot more about that, but I'm thinking maybe Patrick can jump in on this too. Uh, Patrick, if you could talk a little bit about your advocacy work with 22 Too Many and the work you are doing with ADAPT here. The main thing you want to let our audience know in terms of legalizing psilocybin. Absolutely. Well, 22 Too Many um, has been around for a decade now. Um, back in the legal cannabis, um, we are responsible for getting PTSD to Washington State's list of qualifying conditions. We hand delivered that bill to then um, Senator Hobbs, who we all know is the um, Secretary of State now. And um, he supported that bill and he pushed it through and it came through without one single no vote. Um, so that was pretty special. And we've been moving along um, and we've gone from cannabis to psilocybin now as a new natural plant way of healing for our veterans. And we just try to educate as much as we can here and provide a safe space for veterans um, to talk about, learn about, um, and get educated on um, microdosing, um, mushroom cultivation, cannabis cultivation, all those things. This place on the front window, it says hope lives here. And it does. If a veteran finds his way here, um, he'll, he'll, he'll have hope. Okay. Here, Thank, he'll have hope. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, we'll go back to you here. I know you've been pushing the Drug Enforcement Agency to rethink its stance on psilocybin, which is currently a Schedule One drug under federal law, which means the feds think it has no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So the DEA has basically said to you and other cities are saying too, while psilocy psilocybin has shown great promise, it's also a powerful psychoactive substance and we need more research on it. How do you respond to that? Uh, the scientific uh, evidence uh, does not support schedule one status of psilocybin based on the large uh, data and clinical trials that we've had FDA's designation by to, to, to at least two drug manufacturers who are putting psilocybin through the clinical trials process, and it's a break. Can, can I ask, do we need more research before it can be legalized? I think that's part of the oh. question, too. Yeah, well, I mean, so it's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough finding, as according to the Federal Food and Drug Administration. And um, the one of the things that we do have available for for drugs that are in the in the pipeline, that is like that are going through this process, um, uh, phase one, two, three clinical trials, um, after a phase, if you if you pass phase one clinical trials, that means you demonstrated safety. And we have lots of evidence, like, you know, of course, m thousands and thousands of years of, of knowledge of safety history because of the indigenous use of psilocybin around around the world, Mesoamerica, different parts of Asia, a lot of places. So we know it's been used for a long time safely. But and we also have recent clinical trials data uh, showing safety in numerous populations. So that's called passing phase one. And we have a federal law that says that the, the, those substances are legal to be used in patients with life-threatening illness if their doctors feel that that's something that they should be able to try. It's called the right to try law. So we don't need more research to um, implement right to try legal legal access to psilocybin. That, that, that research is already done. The drug is already um, is still undergoing those 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 uh, multi-phase studies for those particular manufacturers, but they are allowed to sell um, psil psilocybin to to a doctor like myself or anyone else who who would petition. But the DEA has not allowed uh, has not given us a, an ability to do that. So I have two uh, petitions in front of them: one to waive a waiver to for them to look at the right to try law. And we had a Ninth Circuit Court case on this. Um, which the Washington Attorney General's office uh, supported us in, which was wonderful. And we are uh, also have a petition to reschedule psilocybin. So okay. those two things are before the DEA. And, and I think the legal uh, action to take, uh, hopefully with the help of Senator Patty Murray's office yeah. or others at Congress will, will get us uh, that legal access for under right to try. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that piece down. Leo, I want to go to you here because I know you've worked in family therapy for many years. Do you recommend psychedelic drugs to all your patients? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's appropriate from that therapy perspective. Do you want these substances to be avail available to everyone? How would you describe that? 
I feel like there's a lot of education that needs to go forth. And so as a family therapist, when you look at ADAPT, the um, addiction, depression, anxiety, psilocybin treatment uh, initiative that we um, that we filed, it really talks about a process where you're screening people. That's the first step for anyone that might be interested. You're doing an intention setting uh, session with the with the client, an administration session and an integration session. Um, and I really want to emphasize that some folks have a tendency towards psychosis. And so um, by no means, I think if you look at the folks that are using psilocybin kind of from a decriminalized perspective now, um, a lot of folks kind of on the underground are aware that, you know, you can't be um, advocating for this medicine with just anyone. You know, it does come down to um, emergency room visits in, in Washington state. The lowest level for any drug is psilocybin. So cannabis is a higher degree of people going to the emergency room for maybe like a, a pot high that feels anxiety provoking. So I think we really need to reconsider how we see psilocybin. It isn't the um, the drug war of the 60s that said all drugs need to be lumped together. This is a, a natural growing fungi that's here in our backyard. You know, So people have been doing it, as Sunil said, indigenously throughout the world since dawn, since the beginning of time. Right, right. Uh, thank you for breaking all those pieces down there. Patrick, I want to go to you here because I know another concern for advocates would be making sure you do legalization right. I know you're taking some risks yourself with the work you're doing to provide natural therapy to veterans, for example. I think the concern would be if you take too many risks, if you push too much before more research is done, the legalized system you want to put in place may not work properly, and then there could be a wave of political backlash that could set your movement back. Any thoughts about that? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think what we're doing here um, is worth it. it. Is worth it for our veterans and our patients. You know, for um, for the first time in our nation's history, if you join the military, you're more likely to die from suicide than in a war. Mm. And that's never been the case in this country until this past decade. And there's not enough being done we have to have more access to medicine for veterans. What the VA, their plan what they do with the pills and give to our veterans, it's just not working. And we need to plant medicine. And uh, I've been approached locally from our city council. If you know, we wanna work with you on a decrim bill in our town for psilocybin. So um, if any, any activist out there wants to get involved, that's the very first step you should take is going to your local council and seeing where they stand on decriminalization. Start small and then just have to bloom out. Um, I'm really excited about being on board with ADAPT and yeah. um, what we do here. I think it's, um, it, it's worth it. It's worth it in the long run to be able to provide these medicines to veterans, so. Got it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, I wanna go to you next here. Let's say our state did approve the therapeutic, uh, therapeutic use of psilocybin. What would that look like? Would it be someone goes into an office, talks to a doctor, takes some of this drug and then stays under medical observation for several hours? I'm trying to figure out what is the most beneficial and the most realistic in terms of making this work? Yes, a lot of uh, uh, lawmakers are trying to figure that out too. Um, we we have a um, uh, Washington State is going to is forming has already to, uh, agreed to form a psilocybin wellness as an opportunities stakeholder group um, that that is being convened by um, you know the state and they're going to be looking at what's happening in Oregon especially because Oregon. By, by the end of this year, uh, December is going to be issuing their first licenses to centers that will be, um, you know, uh, allowing psilocybin services to occur within them. And they were already, um, you know, set up the guidelines for the training of uh, staff that will be helping uh, clients come through those wellness, uh, psilocybin wellness set service centers. So uh, it, there's not, not a reason to invent the wheel and what does what is, what is legal psilocybin look like in the Pacific Northwest? Well, mm. Oregon has, um, has a roadmap. Of course, Washington and Oregon are not the same. We have our own um, way about things, but I think we're, we're, we're learning from each other and we can learn that. And I think there are many different models out there and Oregon's not the only one. There's also um, legal psilocybin access in um, the, the Netherlands. Um, mm. That country has um, been doing this for, for decades. Um, uh, Jamaica, um, and you know a, a number of other countries, and I think it's it's worth to just look and see what what people do. I think 
I think in our in our uh, scenario, um, that that sort of one formal sector piece. There's also use in um, underground, or I would say, uh, religious or spiritual settings. Um, I think ceremonial use of, of psilocybin is something that's can be done. Um, and I think you know, just as long as there's appropriate health and safety screening, uh, as long as there's um, some kind of s support and process, uh, these these substances can be safely done outside of like. You know a, a clinical uh, environment now I, I think they can it can live in both places i just want to explain that because this is really important because this this substance does have a life um outside right. the the walls of our our recently established medical system and we need to right. we need to integrate the two and I, I i think i can see that sort of i hope that sort of gives you a little flavor of what it would look like we what, we, what Leo was saying earlier about preparation, screening preparation, yeah. um, uh, supportive sessions and integration, that's sort of a general framework that really actually comes from the traditional use of psilocybin in, um, in communities, indigenous groups. Um, they understood the, the need for, for having a good preparation period to have support during and then to have integration both individual and community level mm -hmm. so we're really kind of uh, learning from that in, in that model and i think that whatever whichever way it will be present in the community mm -hmm. uh, those elements will be present and i think that's what increase the safety and increase the um you know value uh, for, at the individual and community level sure I, th thank you for that. Patrick, I want to go to you here because you've worked in the medical marijuana space going into recreational too. Is that where you see psilocybin kind of following that type of route there? Could you uh, offer some thoughts on that, please? Yeah, great question. You know, when I did open my um, safe access point um, back in 2001, um, the veterans would just be pouring in and, hey, Patrick, can I talk to you for a minute? And we'd go off to the side and they'd tell me, hey, this is really working for me. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're putting, you know, everything have on the line. Every time I turned the key to open Rainier Express for six years, I was facing life in prison, but I did it for these veterans because they needed access, safe access. Every veteran in America should have safe access to cannabis. Um, but the same thing is happening with psilocybin. Um, we have these markets that were um, giving veterans access to other plant medicines. Cannabis isn't enough. And um, they're doing the same thing, but in higher numbers, actually. Uh, every single veteran that has um, walked out of here with some microdoses to go home and try has come back to me 100%. Patrick, I don't know how to tell you, I don't know how to explain to you, but this is making my day better. And when I hear that from a veteran, I just, it just brings tears to me because some of these veterans um, need that and, and they're not getting it anywhere else. They're sure not going to get it from those pills the VA dumping on these guys and gals. So. Um, this is just another avenue, yeah. another plant medicine, another medicine a veteran okay. can put into their toolbox okay. and take out when they're trying to heal and okay. have as many options in that toolbox as possible. Got it. Uh, Leo, let me go to you here because it almost sounds like Patrick's the, working down this path here of medicinal going into recreational use. Is this the path that you see ahead? Would you like to see both of these things uh, legalized sooner than others, meaning medicinal and recreational at the same time? Or what are we talking about here? So it's interesting. I started off with Entheo Society and with Decrim being such a huge advocate for Decrim, for decriminalization. And I still am. And I feel like a part of me really resonates with that, to be honest. But then there's like another part of me that sees some folks on the underground who are doing it, you know, uh, in the plant medicine community who are doing ceremonies with ayahuasca and so forth. And some of them may have their own like mental health issues or their own, you know, unprocessed trauma that they're potentially projecting on a client. Now, I'm a chemical dependency uh, professional as well as a, a family therapist, and I've worked in social services with the most vulnerable in, you know, King County for the last 20 years, and I've seen a lot of trauma. So everything that Sunil and um, Patrick are talking about in terms of the unmet needs of our populace who are really struggling in these broken systems. Like I used to work in uh, civil commitment in, in, with public defense, and so you see these people cycle in and out of the mental health system that's a taxpayer burden on us a huge cost to the taxpayer but these people will be in 52 times and just you know they'll dump the pharmaceuticals as soon as they get out of the hospital they don't want it you really need to have client buy-in so i think king county as a whole is kind of hitting its head, its head against the wall just like what are what can we change is it housing is it this and it's like well a broken piece of the system to be honest brian is the medicine is the buy-in from the client you really want to meet someone where they're at and have their buy-in 
So I feel like a lot of times we need to really look at where people are at and you can't force a, a legalization model on people who may want to do it ceremonially, like Sunil said, and there's a there are people who are pursuing psilocybin as a religious uh, right, as a religious right to do plant medicine. And so you really have to kind of meet people with where they're at. And so I feel like because I'm leading the legalization effort with my husband in Washington State, I've, I've seen both sides of the coin. And I have to say that both sides have merit. And I think it comes down to meeting that individual with wh where they are at, because mm -hmm. I've seen so much brokenness in the chemical dependency system where we're forcing a 12 step process on people mm -hmm. that is oftentimes very much immersed in shame and Calvinistic thinking that we're not even aware of. So mm -hmm. how do we remove shame for the equate from the equation when we're asking people to heal? No, that's the, um, all great no, questions right. here. And, Brian, and can I, I need, jump in real quick here? Please, we do need to start wrapping up the show here. Some final thoughts, if you would, doctor. Thank you. Sure. I just wanted to say you brought up the word recreational use. And I just I have um, really thought a lot about this concept. And I have a chapter called Deep Respect After Profound Neglect, Spiritual Health and Safety for Use of, of Cannabis and Other Entheogens in an Integrative Public Health System. And I, I, want, I think one of the things that people don't realize is rec recreation, which really means recreate or renew. We use this term like just, oh, yeah, you know, recreation is like it's, it's flippant. But, but mm -hmm. to be able to recreate or renew um, is, should be really understood under the wider category of spiritual well-being, um, because the, the pursuit of pleasure, happiness, connection, um, and, and a, the existential reality that we're all going to die. Um, no. You know, you in order to sort of deal with that reality, we all uh, mm -hmm. have this awareness. It's really important to be able to renew your. Okay, this is this is what this is what the world is. This is what uh, what I am. My yeah. higher uh, at a, at a more fundamental level. And that's okay. that's really what recreation, um, you know, the, that's sort of the the deeper meaning of it. And I think uh, if we sort of reckon, hold on to that concept, mm -hmm. you know, um, spiritual, it'll be mm -hmm. easier to understand the how to reconcile these different systems we're talking about. Because this spiritual stuff Got plays it. a role in every every other area. So that, I guess that would be a, sure. a final thought I want to make, and I want to let everyone know that um, on May 9th, there's going, there's going to be um, a large protest at the DEA um, on that at that federal level issue mm -hmm. um, on right to try and. Okay. Um, some are calling it the largest protest in the history at the DEA headquarters, demanding that they um, stop blocking right to try. And some people want to block access to the DEA offices itself because okay. they believe blocking right to try is a crime. I nice. got it. I have I have about 30 seconds left and maybe I can ask you, Patrick, to wrap this thing up. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what happens here. If this initiative effort doesn't pan out, is it a deal where you try to push this back to the state legislature or what's going on here in the months ahead here? I can give you 30 seconds. Yes, it will never stop if not successful this time, we'll be successful the next time. You know, legislation is hard. We got lucky pushing PTSD through in the first try. That just doesn't happen. And I hope that the, we still have the same people in office that are brave enough to support a bill like they were back when cannabis was being supported. So I beg you, um, if you're voting on psilocybin, please, please talk to the veterans and we'll explain to you why it's so important, why legal is so important. Thank you very much, all of you, for this input here, and we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about legalizing psilocybin for psychotherapy? One person writes, It is time to leave the stereotypes in the past and progress society towards a better, happier, and healthier future. Another person says, Psilocybin shrooms disrupt, potentially damage, normal function of the brain, which presents a danger no matter how natural. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, is it time to pay up Seattle? There's a new push by labor rights groups to set a minimum wage for app-based gig workers. Companies like DoorDash, Instacart, and Amazon say the proposal could hurt drivers and their customers. We deliver the latest on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us.